And good evening, church. It's good to see you here tonight for the Washington Avenue Church of Christ worship service. And tonight is a song service where we will do all the things that we necessarily do uh, to praise God and worship Him. But our emphasis tonight will be on the singing. And so we really want to encourage you all to sing out. I'll tell you, I was inspired this morning for a number of reasons. A lot of good things happened. But one thing, rare in a church, I saw someone had moved from their regular seat and they had moved forward, which I find to be a very good thing. I encourage you to do this on singing nights because I promise you up at the front it sounds way, way different and perhaps even better uh, than if you're in the very, very back. And I have been in both spots. So really uh, encouraged by the bravery of moving seats and please enjoy that, uh, that option if you choose. Uh, tonight we'll start off with Mark Porter is going to lead us in They'll Know We Are Christians by Our Love. That'll be PowerPoint only. Uh, after Mark leads us in three songs, uh, Rodney Seals will lead us in her opening prayer. Paul Edwards will then lead us in four songs, and then Andrew Rogers will lead three before I'll give the lesson, and then Andrew will close us out with the invitation song um, and the closing song. We will offer communion tonight, of course, if you have not yet had the opportunity, that will be at the end. Once again, we're grateful that you could be here tonight. Those of you that are at home on live stream, we're thankful that you could be with us as well, and I trust and know that you'll be singing out with just as much passion and enthusiasm at home as we have here. And it's one of the great things that we uh, enjoy in worshiping God. Glad you could be here. And now I'll turn it over to Mark Porter. Good evening to everyone. First song tonight, they will know we are Christians by our love. <clears throat> we are one in the spirit. We are one in the Next song will be number 523. I know the Lord will find a way for me. <clears throat> I know the Lord will find a way for me. I know the
Number 606, Remind Me, Dear Lord. After this song, Rodney Sills will lead us in a word of prayer. The things that I love and hold dear to my heart are just borrowed, they're not mine at all. Jesus only let me give them to brighten my life. So Would you please bow with me? Dear Father, we come to you thankful that we can be reminded that we are speaking to the God of the Bible. We are speaking to some being, a being that there's none greater, um, nowhere that we can find in the universe that is even close to your power, not in the stars, in the suns, black holes, whatever there is, we cannot find a power such as you, a power that's all-knowing, all-powerful, that doesn't need to be reminded, but we do. Seeing that expression in Christ, your son, how he came and he labored with us, it's just an awe-inspiring thought in our minds as we try to comprehend based on what you've revealed to us, something that as a being such as you are is incomprehensible. Father, we, we're in all of you. We're in all that we get to talk to you. We are sorry that sometimes our prayer to you can become traditional, can become routine. Sometimes we do it when it's something that we've always done, but we ought to always be in awe that we're able to speak to you. And Father, at this small time that we have to uh, that lift up prayers of this congregation to you, we know you're listening, we know you hear us, we know Jesus is moving through his churches, we know that Jesus is 
examining his church. We know that the Holy Spirit is active. And Father, we're just thankful for that tonight. Father, we are thankful for the leadership here. Father, we are thankful for those such as Jerry that has taken on extra role. Father, I ask blessings upon him as the visitation and greeting is, is so important. It's such an important work and bless him and bless the other deacons and bless the elders that labor to do good work, not just so we can have praise of man that's very low uh, in comparison to one day as we sung, hearing well done, thou good and faithful servant from your son. Father, it's those reasons that should drive us to do better in the world, to carry the gospel into the world. It's that reason alone, because people need to hear the good news. People need to see Christians that love one another, because that's how we will be known by our love. And Father, we know that all these things are important, but sometimes we lose our way. And sometimes we get distracted in this world as we were just talking about, sometimes this culture can wear on us, it can be confusing, but we're so thankful that you have an unchanging hand, that your word never changes, it only evolves and grows in our hearts and our lives to help us develop and become better each and every day if we allow your blood to continually cleanse us and we never take our eyes off the cornerstone which is Jesus Christ. Father, it's today we know that dear, you know our needs before we ask them. We know there's people here that are struggling. We know there's so many things going on that people lift up to you at the wee hours of the night, pains and suffering, dealing with illness, dealing with news that could be life-changing. But we also know there's victories of people being baptized and people entering into your kingdom. And Father, just help us balance all of that and become people that aren't so negative in our own thoughts, but always understand that you're the creator of life, and through you, we don't have anything to worry about. Father, it's these things I ask tonight as we go forward with being able to open your word, and Father, we are thankful that we have men that will open your word and have been from this pulpit. We're thankful for David, Thankful for Alan and Andrew. We're thankful for so many people that will stand up here and preach your word in boldness and in truth and not in fear. And Father, that's all we can ask. And it's all these things that I pray in your son's name. Amen. Number 859, number 859, and I'm going to ask if it's convenient to stand for this song, please. 859. <laughs> Where? 
may be seated, sorry. Number 985, when morning comes, 985. Trials dark on every hand, and we cannot understand all the ways that God will lead us to that blessed promised land. But He'll guide us with His eye, and we'll follow till we die. We will understand it better by and by. By and by, when the morning comes, Number 227, <clears throat> 227 on Zion's Glory Summit. On Zion's glorious summit stood a numerous souls redeemed by blood. They had their king and strength divine. I heard the song and stroll to joy.
Number 23. <clears throat> Number 23. Our God, he is alive. And I know we've already stood once, but let's do it again for this one. <clears throat> There is beyond the azure blue a God concealed from human sight. He tinted skies with every hue and framed the world with his great mind. There is a God, he is alive. In him we live. Gave me a song. He took my burdens all away up to a
This next song is a new song of an old song. The song is actually called Agnus Dei. It's a Latin phrase that means Lamb of God. It's actually a very old song. Um, I've been singing for close to a thousand years at this point, uh, but they made a, uh, an arrangement for this. It's very simple, um, so you all will catch on pretty fast. Hallelujah. This next song, Only a Holy God, is a repeat of a new song that we learned last singing night. Um, so we'll sing it again. Who else commands all the host of heaven? Who else could make every king bow down? Who else could whisper and darkness tremble? Shut up. 
Good evening once again. You can say good evening back once again. You don't have to, but anyway, once again, glad you are here and that we could have this time to be able to worship God together. When you think about all the great books of the Bible that contain songs in them, inspirational songs, songs that really inspire you and catch you uh, in a moment, especially a moment of faith. When you think of all the books of the Bible that really tie you to this idea of praising God, Habakkuk may not be the first one that comes to your mind. And yet, it has a very, very powerful song within it. It's just three chapters. It's pretty short. The image that I'm showing you right now is by the artist Donatello, the one the Ninja Turtle is in fact named after. This sculpture was done in 1425, a long time ago. And it's said that this was maybe, maybe his most uh, appreciated sculpture by himself. He really got into this particular one. It is Habakkuk, most people think. Lo Zucone, they call it, the bald man. It doesn't look like a traditional prophet that you would see in sculpture and stuff. Typically they have beards or they're kind of hunched over a little bit. I don't know why they do that. Prophets did suffer a lot, so maybe they were like that to some degree. But Habakkuk, that's who he depicted. And he was so caught up in the sculpting of it, and I don't know if you've ever sculpted before, but it is tedious and it is challenging. I'm awful at it, so I appreciate even more someone who is a master at it. They said that even as he was making it, he would scream at it, call out for it to speak to him, to speak to him. There was a thing where he was just so passionate about it, and he wanted it to really, really communicate everything, everything that it needed to, and it became this masterwork. Now you can spend more time studying that if you want, but what I want us to appreciate is the sense of passion and artistry that he put into a thing, that he put into it. It's about Habakkuk. Tons and tons of sculptures about David or Moses. Very, very few done about Habakkuk. But what a powerful book in those three short chapters. Three short chapters. Habakkuk takes place during this period in which the Babylonians are rising in power and, and there was a lot of chaos that was occurring in the nation of uh, Israel and the surrounding region. And with the rise of Babylon, it seemed inevitable, inevitable that they were going to invade and take over because surely they'd been doing that for some time. And here he is in this very unusual book because a lot of times when the prophets would speak, they would be speaking to the people. They would be delivering God's message to the people. Habakkuk's a little unique in the fact that he doesn't really speak to the people. He does talk about the people, but he talks to God. He's talking directly to God. And there's two things that happen. Well, a couple. One is he lodges this complaint. He's not understanding why there is so much darkness and iniquity and suffering with the people. And he's asking God why, especially in the midst of the holiness of God or the righteousness of God, why? Even in Judah, the religious leaders aren't really leading the way that they should, and the people are inevitably suffering. And God replies to him, and he says he's rising up this nation, the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, and he's going to use them as judgment against the iniquities of uh, Judah and the surrounding area. Habakkuk finds this really difficult to process, really difficult. God, they're even worse the Babylonians are even worse than what's taking place here. How could a righteous and holy God use them in this situation? And he says in chapter 2, he's going to stand up, almost like a watchman at a watchtower, and he's going to wait for God's response. An incredible book. Incredible book. And so God does reply to him, and he asked him to write things down on a tablet, and he wanted it to have that sense of permanence, because God's going to speak something that is pretty weighty, pretty heavy, and it needs to be listened to, and it needs to be heard. And he's going to give these woes. He does five woes for the injustices that are existing in the world. And God's saying, I am not going to tolerate any of it. There will be a day that's going to come in which my judgment will come. Yes, against your people, Habakkuk, because they are sinful and wicked, but yes, also against the Babylonians. And not just the Babylonians. You could almost use them as an archetype. For any other nation that would seem to uh, lift itself up and take pride in its military might or the uh, abuses of its economic practices, its idolatry, its slave trade, against its, uh, he's pretty specific about alcohol in, in chapter two, woe to them if you, you, you give your neighbor alcohol. 
And it seems that there is this endless cycle that seems to go between the rising and falling of nations and empires. That These are the things that mankind uh, esteems to be and to pursue. And God says, no, it might be, it is definitely wicked, but it will not stand. His judgment will come at the point that he appoints judgment to come. Babylon will not flourish. It will fall. And so it did. And any wicked nation who follows after such practices, they will fall, and many have. And until Jesus comes again, they all will. Only his kingdom will remain. I know, a bit of a downer so far, right? But chapter 3, it switches around. And there's this moment in which Habakkuk has come to the realization that God is righteous and God is holy and that God is powerful and that God's judgment will happen. He does request, can it happen in our time period in chapter 3 verse 2. But he starts making these great proclamations about God. And then we're seeing this guy, this prophet, in this conversation with God go through a transformation in his realization, a development of his faith. We're seeing faith unwind and grow as we read this book. And he's recognizing, yes, you are the one true God. And yes, you care for your people. And in chapter 3, verse 13, he says in this prayer, the chapter 3 is really interesting. It's a prayer. He says, you went forth for the salvation of your people, for salvation with your anointed. You struck the head from the house of the wicked by laying bare from foundation to neck. God will be victorious and the righteous will be... um, saved. The wicked will be punished. This is certain. Awesome book. We don't have time to go into all the details of it. It's three short chapters. You should study it. I want us to focus on chapter 3 verse 18. We now move into a song. He closes us out in the midst of that and he needed the context as he goes into it and he writes these words for this song. This part, and we're in the middle of it. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord I will joy in the God of my salvation. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. Those aren't cheap words. Those are powerful words, especially when you read the preceding verse. Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. They don't have any idea how the melody went to this. None. None of it's recorded. And that's really not the important part anyway. Sometimes it's a temptation to get caught up in that. Sometimes it's a, a temptation of, we're going, I wonder how it sounded. Was this a pleasant song or, you know, what kind of scales did it play in and how did they actually sing it? That's a curiosity. The most important thing, even aside from how pleasant it might have been and the vocal talent involved, where was his faith as he said these words? Now that's a relevant question for us to consider. Where was his faith and how did that affect the way he said these words? Because the same thing must be true for us as we sing, no matter the song. Where is your faith and how does that influence the way you sing these songs? That's the artistry of it. The technical aspects of the melody and such and the keys and all that, fine, it's great, it's wonderful, and we enjoy those and that's okay. But the key to Christian worship and singing is where is your faith at? And how does that influence the way that you sing and express these songs? You may look at that lyric and say, well, of course, it's, it's great joy and triumph. Maybe. But given the context, could there be a hint of melancholy to it? Maybe. Could it be a sense that he's trying to believe this? You ever been in that situation in your faith where you know a thing to be true, but you're just trying to grind through it and you know it's true, but you're trying to strive to believe it and you keep repeating it over and over and over again because you want to believe it, you need to believe it, and it takes that process to get there? Maybe that's where his faith was and where he's trying to get to in the song. I tell you what, there's different ways that we sing songs. You think of the various songs that you love and you cherish for a multitude of meaning in your Christian faith. Some, man, they're the most joyous thing in the world and you you just, you gotta bring that to them. Some are so heavy and so sad that you can't bring that sort of spirit of joy to it. It just clashes and it's not right. It, 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 it irks us. And some of that is cultural and 
But a lot of it is where your faith is at that moment to express the song. Even if you take a very common song that we all know, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. How would you sing that in this moment of your life? Well, would you be this? That's some raw energy in that kid, isn't it? Boy, he's going at it on that. Going at it. I tell you what, that kid and this lady, they probably ain't singing it the same way. Different emotions and they're both okay. They both are. And I tell you what, this guy, whatever he's going through in life, when he's singing, Jesus loves me, this I know, it's not the same thing that she's going through. But the words are true. And if the faith is true, if the faith is true and you're driving towards God, then we should enjoy the process of worshiping in such an expressive way. It's got to be true in the way that we express it and the way that we sing it. It's the beauty of worship. It's got to be true. And I got to mean the words. The songs that we sing aren't just the melody and they aren't just the key and all that. I've got to mean those words. I've got to understand them. But at the same time, this guy, he's understanding a different kind of life than this kid. And that's going to come through in the way they sing. And this, this is when we elevate our worship. Because we're not just going through a process we're expressing faith. And we're not just expressing faith for entertainment, we're expressing our devotion and our praise and our lives to God, towards God. This is where the Bible tells us to sing, where we are admonishing and edifying, where we're teaching. This is where it comes, it really comes from. This is what I would encourage us to think about in our faith and the way that we translate that into our worship. What a wonderful thing to be able to worship God but it's got to be real and genuine. And I know it's hard sometimes. A little bit of vulnerability goes into that. Maybe you're not comfortable sometimes. And to that I would say, maybe we need to help each other become comfortable singing in those particular ways. One of my favorite singers, I was reading an interview with him and I think I'd mentioned this to you before, but I read this uh, recently and it really struck me because he was talking about the first time he heard a song that they recorded and he didn't want it to be released, and he started crying. Not because he was sad, it's just that he had never been so vulnerable and open in the way that he sung, and now it was out there for millions of people to listen to. Whew, you're vulnerable in those moments. It's an amazing song. But part of it was because he was so honest in the way he sang. Other people could probably sing it technically better, but not that honestly in that vulnerability that comes out of it. Isn't it good that there was the space for that to happen? In our church, Amongst our church family, isn't it amazing when we allow each other to have the freedom to be so vulnerable and so honest and so genuine in order to sing? Someone may not sing the same way that you do, but if you see that it's that honest and real thing, not performative, but it's real and genuine in the way that they're obeying God in song and putting the, their heart into it, oh, encourage that, lift that up. And if that encourages you to jump into it as well, please do. May our worship to God always be true. May the words of every song we sing be absolutely scriptural, biblical, and true. May it be very real, but allow us to express ourselves. And that doesn't mean you get up and start twisting and turning and dancing. Jerry might tackle you if you do that. I'll back you up, Jerry. <laughs> but mean what you sing. Really mean it. That's the beauty we have tonight. Habakkuk, beautiful, beautiful prophet. Beautiful, beautiful sentiment. That guy was going through some heavy things. You may be as well. You need to know that the church is a place where you can come to if you're going through some heavy things. It may be also that you're going through some wonderful things and your life is being incredibly blessed. Church is the place you come to in those moments too. God is good. God is good because if you're suffering, he is the answer. God is good because if things are going really, really well, he might be blessing you. Praise him for that thing. And it might be that right now you, you don't have an answer and you're looking for one. Church is the place to be for that, especially a church that loves the scripture so much and that's what we want to be. Especially a church that loves the people so much and that's what we want to be. Especially a church that's going to try to help you connect with God. That's where you want to be. Tonight, if there's a way that we can lift you up, that we can serve you, that we can be there with you, please, please, please let us know. And as we sing this very last song, and Andrew's chosen a very good one, Think about your faith and how you want to express it in this song. And I would encourage you, do not hold back. I know it's personal, but we're church family. 
We get the joy of singing together in worship to God. My goodness, we are a blessed people. If there's a way that we can help you tonight, please come forward as we stand and as we sing. Redeem how I love to proclaim it. Redeem by the blood of the Lamb. Redeem through His infinite mercy. His child and forever I am. Redeem.